There's one man who controls the fate of world peace. One man who decides if there will be a World War III or not. One man who has single-handedly destroyed the decades of progress in the world's fastest growing country. One man who is the embodiment of absolute power. That man is Xi Jinping. And that man has just been elected to rule China for a third term, making him China's foremost authority for another five years. With tensions between the East and the West at all-time highs, the question of whether the world will survive Xi's third term is yet to be answered. And as we wait for that verdict, let's look into the man that's been titled by The Guardian the most powerful man in China since Mao Zedong. Among the so-called sent-down youth deployed to the countryside as part of Mao's re-education program. After serving as party chief in the village, she rose through the ranks to become party secretary of Hebei province. Almost everyone on earth is familiar with the name Xi Jinping, or at the very least has been affected by the man in one way or another. We made a video on this channel about his grip on various countries. Check it out to see just how many strings Xi has to pull. What many don't know is how he rose to the position of power that he's in now. A position that is starting to look more permanent with every passing year. Let's peek behind the authoritarian veil and take a look, shall we? Xi Jinping was born in Beijing in 1953. As the son of a revolutionary veteran, Xi Zhongzhen, one of the Communist Party's founding fathers and a former vice premier. This automatically made Xi one of the princelings, the term that was given to children of elite senior officials. Because of his family history, Xi was destined for great things. But, well, things took a bit of a dramatic turn for young Xi. Around 1962, when China was under the Mao regime, Mao himself became deeply suspicious, as he feared that he might be overthrown. To curb this, he started persecuting political rivals, one of them being, yes, you guessed it, Xi Jinping's father. By the time 1966 came around, when the Cultural Revolution began, China saw harsh persecution of the masses under the guise of them being enemies of Chinese culture. It was during this time that Xi's troubles heightened as his family suffered greatly. All the benefits that Xi had grown to love and enjoy were stripped off of him. He was sent from Beijing to the countryside for re-education and hard labor in the remote and poor northeastern village of Liangjiehe for seven years. Things only got darker for them. It was during this period that Xi's half-sister took her life because of the severity of the hardships. Well, at least that's the popular narrative. In reality, it's most likely that the poor girl was persecuted to death. China in that period was not a fun place to be, especially when your father was in prison as an enemy of the state. So now I've got a question for you. If the party you loved wrongly imprisoned your father, sent you to a dirt poor village to live as a peasant under harsh conditions, imprisoned you several times, and was directly involved in the death of your sister, what would you do? I can already hear some of you sharpening your knives and dusting out your gun cabinets. I'd probably do the same too. But you see, that's why you and I are not the president of China. Xi took a different route. Seeing the power that the Communist Party had to affect all these changes, he embraced communist ideals even more strongly. He denounced his father publicly and dug himself deeper into the party structures as best he could. In a 1992 interview with the Washington Post, Xi said of his experiences under the CCP, even if you don't understand, you're forced to understand. It makes you mature earlier. After seven years of working as a farm laborer, an agricultural technician, a tractor trailer driver, and a barefoot doctor, fate smiled on Xi as he was elected as the local party branch secretary in his last two years. He would then go to the prestigious Tsinghua University in Beijing, where he graduated in 1979. In a series of good fortunes, Xi was immediately given a plum assignment, working as the personal assistant to Geng Biao, a vice premier who also served briefly as the defense minister. In 1982, Xi was sent to work at the local level as a party secretary in a poor county in Hebei province. Eventually, he became the vice mayor of Xiamen, 
where he is credited with pushing that city's economic reform and open-door policies. Don't think it was always sunshine and roses, however. His rise in the party structures was not without its challenges. Even he can't be that lucky. In 1989, at the age of 35, he was party chief in the city of Ningde in southern Fujian province, when protests demanding greater political freedom began in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. Even though that province was far from the capital, Xi, along with other party officials, reportedly scrambled to contain local offshoots of the massive demonstrations underway in Beijing at the time. Yes, those are the very same bloody protests that China has almost effectively erased from the history books, the Tiananmen protests. Those protests resulted in the death of thousands under the iron fist of China. In case you don't know about them, they looked something like this. this. hour, there are hundreds of thousands of people here in Tiananmen Square, perhaps as many as a half a million, even more. In the history of communist China, there has never been anything like this. For the first time in huge numbers, the ordinary men and women of Beijing, the old and the young, professors and taxi drivers, have joined the student protest. Given what Xi has done in China, something we will talk about soon, it really is no surprise that he had a hand in the Tiananmen protest curbing. After several years of working within party structures, Xi was later put in charge of the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing. This was a very important assignment as China was keen to show it had moved on from its bloodied past and was a worthy host. For context, this was because China lost a previous bid in the 2000 Olympics due to all the human rights abuses associated with the Tiananmen Square massacre. Xi's work behind the scenes had the intended effect, and the game served as a strong symbol of China's rise as a growing power. All his successes did not go unnoticed, and Xi was propelled to the party's top decision-making body the Politburo Standing Committee. This eventually climaxed in 2012, when the former princeling turned peasant took his final turn to become China's president. This man was barely known outside China a year ago. Now Xi Jinping is about to become one of the most powerful people on the planet, the leader of the world's most populous nation. Xi Jinping has become the most powerful leader in China as leader of the Communist Party. The new Chinese leaders revealed Led by president-in-waiting Xi Jinping, the seven men file onto a stage in the Great Hall of the People. Talking about Xi Jinping's rise and power is a bit inconsequential if we don't talk about his philosophy. What drives him? What does he model himself after? What is he trying to achieve? What is his thought process? Those are likely questions you have, and those are the answers I'll try my best to provide. The first thing to understand is that Xi, much like John Wick, is a man of focus, commitment, and sheer Chinese will. Yeah, I can't really use that other word. It's not advertiser-friendly and whatnot. The idea that he and only he is the rightful leader of China is so deeply ingrained in him that it is his identity. More than that, he believes that China, if left unattended, will become the land of the rowdy. So. He's the man to keep order and consensus in the nation. What makes him so scary is that he's not pretending, nor is he faking it. He truly believes in his ideals. And whether they are right or wrong, he cannot be persuaded otherwise. Upon coming to power, Xi has targeted corruption, taking on officials as powerful as Xiao Yongkang, the former head of China's security apparatus. He restructured the military, the media, and legal disciplinary institutions to assert stronger party control. He has not been afraid to adopt policies from the past that he felt are beneficial to his regime, but at the same time, he is not hesitant to dispose of old policies that stand in his way. A good example of this is the rule that China's president and vice president could serve no more than two terms, a rule that was set by then-CCP leader Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s to prevent Mao-like dictatorship again in China. What does Xi think of this rule? It's garbage. To solidify his own power in the nation, he did away with term limits and got himself elected for another five-year term, an action that can very well make him the leader for life. He even enshrined Xi Jinping thought in the constitution rendering himself indivisible from a party that permeates every aspect 
of Chinese society. By all accounts, Xi Jinping is the party. Disobeying him is disobeying the party, and wronging him is wronging the party. This in a nation that believes that party comes above all. You see what he did there? The man's a genius, even though that application may not necessarily be for the greater good. Xi's own ambitions, even abroad, have not been any less drastic either. As the head of the second largest economy in the world, the largest by some counts, Xi has expanded China's global power through multi-billion dollar development projects like the Belt and Road Initiative. I've made a video in the past about this on the channel. If you haven't watched it, I highly consider having a look. He has also secured China's position by gaining influence in powerful institutions like the United Nations. Ultimately, Xi wants to see China at the top of the world's ladder, and his policies have only become more aggressive as a reflection of this agenda. Xi often says that this era is one of great changes unseen in a hundred years. Namely, that the world's top superpower, the United States, is in decline, and that this is China's moment to rise. Xi has also been quoted as saying, Systemic advantages are a nation's greatest advantages, and systemic competition is the most fundamental competition between nations. On top of that, he's also made several other comments that have had the international community shaking. Like in Paris, back in 2014, when he invoked Napoleon's remark that China was a sleeping lion, and said that the lion has already awakened, but this is a peaceful, pleasant, and civilized lion. He has also said that he intends to make China's voice heard and inject more Chinese elements into international rules. Such remarks from someone who has so much power and influence, and usually does not adhere to rules, are quite worrying. His cementing of power and policy within China has not been without cost, both internationally and locally. Within China, many have said that Xi's regime has brought about the end of true democracy in China. For a country that was never really quite free from the beginning, such remarks are alarming at the very least. It's not hard to understand where these comments come from, however, because Xi has stifled all perceived threats to social stability. This not only in the form of protests or dissidents, but also human rights lawyers, labor activists, poets, feminists, and anything else he views as a threat. There is virtually no free press or freedom of speech within China anymore. The United Nations has even acknowledged this through tweets and articles like this. But, as I said at the beginning, it seems like no one can hold Xi accountable for anything. Violence erupted at the world's largest iPhone factory in China as more than 6 million people were placed on new COVID lockdowns. Crowds of workers who have been under grueling COVID restrictions clashed with authorities in hazmat suits. Violent clashes erupted Tuesday night between factory workers and police at China's so-called iPhone city been going on since June, nearly six months of protest. We've seen the police attempt to storm one of the city's major universities and failing to do so. There are growing fears the Chinese government may use the military to crack down on protesters in Hong Kong. Protesters and police clashed, there were injuries, there were arrests. Beijing has described the pro-democracy protests as, quote, conduct close to terrorism. He has launched sinicization programs targeting religious and ethnic minorities, including the mass incarceration of Uyghurs and other Muslims. Regardless of public outrage and international acknowledgement, no definitive action is yet to be made against him. Perhaps the world truly fears the wrath of Xi Jinping that much. With the economic and military might he wields, it is frankly not surprising. Xi Jinping also managed to use the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to test the ability of the party state surveillance mechanism over ordinary people. Through the harsh conditions of zero COVID and the militant implementations of his policy, Xi has strained the boundaries of what it means to have a free nation. I hope that you now all understand the philosophy that Xi has and how it drives him. One can very well say he is a patriot, a zealous patriot, who believes he is the only one who can make China as great as it should be. He's a control freak who, in an attempt to avoid deposition and dissent, has centralized everything around him. Within the CCP itself, Xi acts as if 
he is personally in charge of everything. He chairs eight of the leading small groups, including the National Security Commission. Xi also handles internal security directly, thereby reducing the chances of a coup. Given that he has been in power for 10 years with no successful coups, I mean, you kind of got to hand it to the man. It's working. In addition, Xi's hold on the People's Liberation Army is extreme. Tai Ming Sheng, the director of the UC Institute of Global Conflict and Cooperation, has said, No other Chinese Communist Party leader, not even Mao Zedong, has controlled the military to the same extent as Xi does today. Mao had to share power with powerful revolutionary era marshals, where Xi does not. To grow the pro-Xi China that he wants, Xi understands the effect of cultivating future generations much like what happened to him. To this agenda, he has tightened control over schools from kindergarten through university, reinforcing patriotic education with his Xi Jinping thought as a guiding ideology. Talk about grooming from the grassroots. If you've been watching our China videos on the channel, I'm sure you've seen the various unfriendly policies and actions that China has made. Take a look at my videos like this one. The person behind those decisions is none other than Xi Jinping, and his ambition fuels his decisions. When Xi took over in 2012, the world expected he would lead the CCP and China to further embrace democracy and a market economy. However, a decade later, they are facing a leader whose desire to rewrite the world order has led to a far more dominating, aggressive, and isolated presence than before. And though he has absolute power, his reign is not without opposition and resistance. Things like this, and international protests like this, remain, even as the CCP tries to censor matters. Speaking without partiality, to some, Xi is a hero who is solidifying China's strength internationally, even as others see him as evil incarnate. As the world sees him terrorize places like Taiwan, some locally hail him as a hero for showing China's strength. I say this to emphasize that his reign of power for so long has not remained out of sheer fear. Xi has loyalists who see him as the future of China. They see him as the warrior wolf who will ride the eastern dragon to prosperity. For the rest of the world, we'll have to see if anything changes as we enter his third term of power. YouTube has been demonetizing my videos because it considers topics related to the CCP to be a bit too controversial. That's why I'm relaunching my Patreon where you guys can support the videos I make and this time I promise to be more active on the Patreon. I will also be releasing all the videos uncensored on Patreon as well. You can find more details by clicking the link in the description and support the channel.